Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. This is True News, the End Times newscast. I'm Rick Wiles. True News is the most popular Christian radio program in the world. And we are the only newscast that is reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Well, I haven't talked with Mina Lee Gribben for many months. Based in Charlotte, North Carolina, Mina Lee leads Faithful Walk Healing Ministries. The website is faithfulwalkhealingministries.com. Mina Lee, welcome back to True News. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be back on the program again. You know, last year, uh, in your first interview, it, it, which was in early 2015, you talked about various dreams that the Lord had given you. And uh, in particular, there was a dream in which you saw the months going by on the calendar. Uh, if I recall, September, October, November, December— And then you heard the words, uh, the end of money. Uh, Can you recount that dream for us? Yes, it was um, actually, it was a vision that I had in the beginning of 2014 that I spoke about on your program in May of 2015, because the Lord brought it back to me um, in February of 2015. It was a vision of the black horse, a rider on the black horse that we find in Revelation chapter 6, I think it's the third seal. And he was riding across the months of September, October, and December. And the Lord said, death to the finances. And then he said, the second thing he said was that a recession within a recession was coming. And he said that that to tell his children that the banks would fail, that small businesses would fail, that government assistance would fail, and that um, retail would fail, and housing would fail, and that their only source was that he, they needed to trust him. They needed to not put their trust in the money. They need to not put their trust in the economy nor in government assistance, but that he to put their trust in him because he would be the only one to see them through what was coming. Minoli, has the Holy Spirit been speaking anything new to you in, in recent months uh, about world events? Yes, um, there's a couple of things that have happened. If you remember when I first came on your program last year, the time frame that I was giving was given was going into 20, all the way till 2017, stopping at 2017. I couldn't see anything beyond 2017. Um, but beginning at the end of last year, all the way throughout this year, and we're here, and a lot of things have been uh, set up, the stages, um, are being set up even with this, what has happened with the Supreme Court. Um, there is all signs that we're being set up for the one world order and it's right in front of us. And so, um, last month in January and just a few days ago, I've been given two things in regards to, um, this year and to probably the beginning of 2017. Um, the first thing um, that actually mentioned this, and we have a watchman on the wall meeting, my ministry, we do this once every seventh Friday, so we had one in January, beginning of January, and I spoke about a couple of things that the Lord had given me for this year. Um, the first thing I think that's most important is that he told me that the glory, his glory will be shown in 2016, but that, although that sounds on a positive note, and it is a positive note, what he was saying and what he said in addition to that, he says, in other words, that the glory of man will be removed. Um, so the the thing is, is that we as people and the Christians, I'm just going to pick on the Christians, um, you know, we talk a lot about um, the God of the New Testament. You know, we talk about him being, you know, full of grace and mercy, which he is, and his mercy endures forever, his grace is sufficient. Um, we talk about love and forgiveness, and um, we talk about the blood of Jesus, which covers our sins, which is all true. But we don't realize that that same God of the New Testament is also the same God of the Old Testament. It's the same God that is fierce, the God of judgment, the God of war the God who is great and terrible, as the scripture says. 
And we don't want to talk about that part. We only want to talk about the feel-good part. And so anytime we mention judgment or whatever, people want to run or shy away or they want to say, oh, you're doom and gloom. But we have, we've missed the first half of the Bible of the God of judgment. And that God still exists today. Um, it's just that we have the grace to give us the extra time, which we've had 2,000 years. And this is the dispensation of grace. It's been 2,000 years. So, um, and now we're coming to a close. I mean, this is the end of the age of the dispensation of grace. And so the end of it is bringing, it ends with judgment once again, even the wrath of God as is stated in Revelation. Um, the Lord told me in January that, which I had talked about this on my Watch from the Wall meeting, for those who tuned in, we have people tuning in from all over the world for those meetings every seven weeks. Um, the first thing he told me is that we were going to see a great pestilence. Um, he showed this to me twice, that a great pestilence was coming to the planet. Um, it both involved both the United States and the world, um, but most of the places I saw was here in the U.S. now. I don't know what the pestilence is. I saw an infestation um, that represented pestilence, um, and he let me know that it was coming, a plague, so to speak, I should say, specifically a plague, a particular plague. Now, since then, um, and then those who listen on my, my watch on the wall before can be a witness to this, and I'm not making this up, but I, that I did state about this in January. But since then, there's been this issue with the Zika virus um, that has now become, I think, pandemic or what have you. I don't know if this is the plague that the Lord showed me and told me that was coming, but I will tell you what he told me about the Zika virus, that it was man-made. And so that's the most that I can say. That's so interesting, Mina. You said the Holy Spirit told you that the Zika virus, this is not a, a natural uh, occurring pestilence, that this was man-made? He told me very clearly. He said, when I asked him about it, someone on my meeting mentioned it, and I had never, I hadn't heard about it at that point. She said, Mina, have you heard about the Zika virus? I said, no. And when I made the, you know, announcement that this is what the Lord showed me. So some people had sent me some information on it, and I prayed and asked the Lord about it. And he said it was man-made. He says that this was, this was whatever's going on with the Zika virus. I think it's causing shrunken head syndrome in Central and South America. And I think there's been some issues in Florida since then. He said that it was man-made and that man is spreading it, not the mosquito. That's what he told me. All right. Regarding this uh, great pestilence, this plague that the Lord told you is coming to America, did he, did he indicate to you whether this was a divinely sent plague or is this another man-made plague possibly uh, released by terrorists or enemies of America? Did he give you any, any revelation on it? No, he didn't. But what I saw was I was going into cities. Some cities I recognized, others I didn't, and I was trying to warn the people. This thing was spreading so quickly, but it wasn't like, um, okay, so let me just give an example, like the Black Plague. We know the Black hit Plague killed, I don't know, it was like 60 million people across Europe. It's not one of those type of like uh, uh, apocalyptic. I see there's a difference between something being catastrophic and something being apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. Um, you're not, I'm not talking about millions of people dying, that type of instance, but he did not tell me whether it would be man-made or whether it would be just a really nasty virus. Um, I don't think it really matters at this point. We have so much out there that is man-made, you know, that is, and then we do have, you know, the threat of chemical or biological warfare, I should really say, that falls into the category of biological warfare. So I'm not sure. I just know that I was going to cities trying to warn the people, and people were just not listening. They just kept saying, it's not, it's okay, it's not a problem, you're just overreacting. And I just found that people were not listening to me. Um, and that, that was a dream that I actually had in the second part, the second, the part two part, was when the Lord spoke to me again and, and, and told me, he spoke to me, and he said that a great pestilence was coming to the planet. It's not just America. The thing is, is that it's going to be widespread. So in other words, it, I don't know if it's going to start outside of this country and bleed into this country or if it's going to start here and bleed out of the country. But we're not the only place that's going to be affected by it. I just don't know if we're the starting point or if we're the finish point. 
but that America, the United States of America, is going to be affected by this virus, whatever the plague, the plague virus is. Were you given a time frame? No, I was not. Did you uh, see or hear references to, to travel restrictions? No, I was not given that either. Mm-hmm. Okay. What else has the Lord spoken to you about? So the same time that he was talking to me that same week about this pestilence that was coming, um, he gave me a scripture another night. um, And the scripture is in Ezekiel chapter 9. It's a a short scripture. It's got like 11 verses to it. But he began speaking to me. He had me. Well, he was talking to me first, and then he gave me the scripture. Then I came out of the experience to set up and read my the scripture in the middle of the night, um, which led, led into some other things that we'll go and hopefully we'll go into um, before we're done. The um, this is this is the heavier part. So Ezekiel chapter nine. Um, I'm I'm going to read it real quick if that's okay. Sure. It says, "Then he called out." You know, a lot of people know about Ezekiel. Ezekiel is the watchman. Um, it says, then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice saying, let those who have charge over the city draw near with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with an axe battle, a battle axe in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen and a writer's inkhorn at his side. And they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the Lord of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the men clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within there. And to the others he said in my hearing, Go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have pity, but utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, and do not come near anyone whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Then he said to them, defile the temple, fill the courts with the slain, go out, and they went out into the city to kill. I'm going to stop there. That was the end of verse 7, because the rest of it just goes on, and and those who are listening, if you just look at it, it's just 11 verses, it's a short chapter, but it's a very powerful chapter, because what the Lord is, what what happened in this vision that Ezekiel saw is that seven people were appointed, one to go out and mark those. Who had, who had been repented or had weeped in anguish for the abominations in the city, those who had remorse. But the six men that were behind this man were told, go and kill all of those who, did, who do not have the mark. And then he says something very powerful, start at my sanctuary. What the Lord had given me in regards to this scripture, because he said this first and he gave me the scripture, he told me that we're about to see more pastors drop dead. The thing is, is that, and this is for America, this is not just worldwide. You know, they talk about the scripture about judgment has to come to the house of the Lord first before he can judge the world. Um, the unfortunate thing is that the majority of the churches today, the pastors are full of greed, they're full of hypocrisy, they're they're full of ear tickling messages. They're not really teaching salvation, deliverance, repentance, hell, rapture, tribulation, end times, what have you. They're not teaching any of this anymore. It's just about what can keep the people gathered together in their churches so that they can line their pockets with their money. Weeping, he said, those who are not weeping or who are not in anguish for the abomination. And he says, start in the sanctuary. So he told me, he said, that 
There's great bloodshed coming to the United States of America. This is what the word was. And I'm not, I just want to say this for my disclosure. You know, this is not about doom and gloom. I mean, there's always a way out. The way out is always Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus, trusting in him, you know, and being wise and preparing. But we have to understand that this is, we, the same God of the New Testament is the same God of the Old Testament. And the prophecy, what is written in the word has to be fulfilled or the word of God is not true. And we're living in these last days. He told me that bloodshed is coming to America. How? Okay, so I know the how time frame. I don't have that. He did not tell me that. Um, but great bloodshed is coming. But before we see, whether it's an attack, um, whether it's war coming to our shorelines, I'm not sure. But before we see that, we're going to see more pastors judged by the hand of God. He's, when he said to me, that 2016 would be a year that his glory will be shown, and that meant that the, the glory of man was going to be removed. He said that they will know that my word is true, that it will not return void, and that I will not be mocked, and that my word says that my spirit will not strive with man always. That's what he said to me. I put that out on a video that's on my YouTube. It's a six-minute video where he told me that that I put out a month ago, the beginning of January. And so this is following into that, um, that he will not be mocked. And so he, we're going to see more pastors exposed. We're going to see more pastors, unfortunately, removed, sick. Now, I will tell you something else he said to me that doesn't necessarily pertain to the judgment of the churches, but but is is in addition to it, he told me that he's been taking those who have been running this race, who have been holding the torch was actually the word he or the term he used, who had been holding the church, I mean the torch for many years, he was take he had been taking them home. Now these are the ones that are going home. And, you know, in the last ten years we've lost a lot of great people. We lost Grant Jeffrey, David Wilkerson, John Paul Jackson, um um, Steve Hill, we've lost a lot of people just in the recent years. But he said, uh, Miles Monroe was taken last year, um, just to name a few. But he says he's taken the ones who have been holding the torches for a long time home. And the reason why he was doing this was to make room for the, the, the new, the new run, forerunners that he had appointed for this final season. Um, and that those are the ones who will be the no names. They, he said they will not be the ones that are well known. They're not the ones that are sitting in the mega churches today, but they were, he's rising up a, a remnant, a radical remnant that has been hidden. And they will be the ones to, to that the torches will be passed to, but that the ones who the the ones who we know today as the majority of this a lot of these mega churches now I'm not saying all of them but the majority of them unfortunately he's bringing them he's going to uncover their sins where he will get the glory and their glory that they have been walking in will be stripped from them and the scripture he gave in regards to this. Was the, this was the first part, was Ezekiel chapter 9. Mina, I've quoted uh, Ezekiel 9 many times over the years. It's a scripture that has meant a lot to me. And I've reminded our audience uh, throughout the years uh, that the Spirit of the Lord would cover and protect those who weep and mourn and um, have great sorrow in their hearts because of the sin and the lewdness and the, the debauchery of the, of the society around them. Some people say, well, that's Old Testament. That, that's Ezekiel. That's thousands of years ago. It has nothing to do with the modern times. We're in the New Testament church. Well, interestingly, the ninth chapter of the revelation of Jesus Christ corresponds to the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. In the ninth chapter of Revelation, the word says, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then 
out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were and they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like a torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days men will seek death and not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. So, I mean, there's in in the last days there's there is uh, some type of tormenting plague that will be released upon the human race, and those humans who have the seal of God on their forehead will be protected. Yes, and it's the same type of person, the men and women of God, who weep and mourn and show sorrow because of the sins and the debauchery and the lewdness and the wickedness and the violence of the society around them. So many people that would attend church, they say that they're Christians, but they have no sorrow over the sins of their, of their own nation. I talk to church members all the time who honestly cannot understand what I'm talking about, and about brokenness, sorrow, grief over America's murder of millions of babies, over the selling of baby parts, over America's uh, violence and bloodshed in the streets, uh, the, over America supplying ISIS with the weapons to kill Christians. They have no sorrow over it. I don't think they're protected when these plagues come. No, they're not. Um, you know, what he told me at the end of last year that I had spoke about in many of the conferences that I traveled all over the uh, country last year was talking about the separation of the wheat and the tares. Um, and at that time, the sheep and the goats, and at that time is at hand um, because of what, what is unfolding. It's not even what's coming, it's here. You know, and I think the thing that grieves me the most is how many people in the church are so blind. They're so blind. I think that that's the most grievous thing to me as a minister, as a teacher, as a prophet, that, you know, there, I mean, there, there are people I've, I've traveled all over the country last year. Right now I've got traveled all the way through June of this year, and this is just the beginning of 2016. You know, and so I know that there are places where people are listening, people want to know, but that that ratio is so small compared to the majority that are are just asleep. It's, you know, they're asleep, and I, I, it grieves me. It grieves me. Um, I keep saying to the Lord, we're not ready. We're not ready. I can, you know, the... Um, there's so many people, you know, at the end of the year, or not even the end of the year, it was actually started in October, started coming again. Um, so many people who had spoken, like Jonathan Kahn and, you know, Mark Bills or what have you. And, you know, it was just great. And it was some of them were well-known pastors that spoke out publicly against these people. Um, and it's so grievous. And I've had phone calls from some of these people ask me about my thoughts and, um, my concerns in regards to it, I always expect people to, to come against me. I mean, it's just a part of the territory. It comes with the package. It doesn't bother me. My mom raised me really well. She says, listen, if they're talking about you, you're doing something right. Because it's when everybody starts liking you that you need to realize that you're probably on the wrong side of the track. <laughs> so I'm used to it. But just I spent a lot of time at the end of 2015 encouraging a lot of people that, that most people have only watched on television and heard about um, because I kept saying this is the separation that must come. I and mean, we always kind of relate back to what Christ, what was going on in Christ's time. It was, there was a separation. You know, many didn't believe. Many didn't follow him. Many didn't recognize who he was. You know, and so there was a great falling away, and it's the same type of thing um, that's happening, 
Now, I put out on my Facebook page a few weeks ago, I said the reason why the majority of the Jews missed the, the first coming of the Messiah is because they were looking for a lion, but they got a lamb. You know, the Jews were looking for a king who would come and rescue them from the, their enemies, from the Romans. They wanted someone to rule because of the prophecies about the ruling with the iron scepter. And so, and they were looking for a lion, but they got a lamb and they missed it. They got a baby that was born in a barn, that was raised in Nazareth, that was the, the son of a carpenter that later became a single, the child of a single parent, you know, and so on and so forth, and they missed it. And I said the reason why so many Christians today are going to miss the coming of the bridegroom is because they're looking for a lamb, but he's coming back as a lion. Now they want to embrace the lamb. They want to embrace, you know, the God that is just, you know, oh, we've got time. He loves us. He forgives us. And, you know, you know, oh, you know, Jesus loves us all. We're not going to go through anything, blah, 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 you know. And they're looking for that lamb mentality, but he's coming back as the roaring lion, and we're going to miss it because of that. That's a very powerful thought. The religious elite of Israel we're looking for a lion, and the Lord came as a lamb. The religious elite of the church today is looking for a lamb, and he's coming as a lion. It's a very deep thought. The Lord um, allowed something very phenomenal to happen to me um, at the beginning of this month. So um, when I came on your program last year, I talked about some of my history of how I came to this point, and um, and a lot of people know that I had dreams in the early 80s as a little girl, six, seven years old. But how I found out about my calling was through uh, a prophetess, a well-known prophetess who mentored my mother in the early, early 80s. Um, and I had been seeing dreams and visions for a whole year and didn't tell anybody because I didn't understand what I was seeing except for the visitations that I had from Jesus. I knew it was him because he told me it was him. But this woman um, came to my mother and on a Wednesday night Bible study and looked at me and just started telling my mother everything that I had been seeing for the last year, which shocked me. I still remember that night to this day. And she was the one who told my mother what my calling was, and she prophesied that, for my, well, she instructed my mother at that point to begin training me up strategically in the Word of God and teaching me, but she told my mother that my ministry would not begin or would not be until the, she put the last hope, oh, the last of the last days before the return of the Lord. Those were her exact words to my mother 30 years ago this year. On February 1st of this year, I reconnected with that person for the first time in 30 years. I had not spoken to this woman or seen her in 30 years, and she remembered me. And the interesting thing is that she told me she had been following me since the summer, and I was really shocked. Now, the point is, is that when I talked to her, we spent five hours on the phone on February, the night of February 1st, and she began sharing with me with some of the things that God had given her but one of the things that fell and co or coincided with what God was giving me that we were just kind of bouncing off of each other. She's, she's 65 years, 60, 65 years old. And, um, now she told me that the Lord had told her about two seasons for 2016. And the first season, she said, Mina started from January 1st to through February 20th, which is just in two days. And the Lord spoke to her and said that during this time, he had placed it on the hearts of his children to fast. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because I know at least a half a dozen people, including myself, that just all of a sudden in January, right before January, we were like, we need a fast. And I'm not talking about the group church fast that the churches like to go on, the 21-day fast that all of these mega churches like to get together and do every year. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about God placing on people's hearts to fast. I know a half a dozen people that when I told them the Lord, including me and my husband, we talked about it. 
We went on a 40-day fast. And other people were like, God just told me, well, another prophetess I know that I'm very close to in St. Louis, she said, the Lord, I was talking to the Lord, he said, I want you to fast. So I found that very powerful because she said she did a 30-day consecration. It's this, um, the lady who spoke in my life 30 years ago. And um, she said that during that season that God was moving a lot of things around to shift and to prepare for the second phase or phase two. And I says, okay, what's phase two? She said, phase two starts from the end of February through the end of September. And she told me, she says, mean, a great darkness is coming up on the planet. And that's what he's preparing his children for. Um, another lady that, uh, close to the one in St. Louis, who is, we, we're like sisters. Um, the Lord came to her and, you know, I have permission to talk about this, but she, the Lord came to her a couple of weeks ago. She had an incredible experience where she was woken up at five o'clock in the morning and told to sit in her living room. And um, she, you know, has empty nest syndrome. Her kids are all grown and what have you. She's got grandkids. And she said, me and I went and sat in my living room. And she said, I felt this presence begin to fill my room, the living room into my kitchen. And angels just started walking into her, her house. She got a little house in St. Louis. And they just came and filled her whole living room and the kitchen, just came in and just started standing around. And then she said, after that, the Lord walked through her door. She said, girl, Jesus walked through my door. And he began talking to her. He had her to write down. Uh, she said it ended up being like three pages. She read it to me, which is uh, it was phenomenal. But what the Lord was saying to her to sum it up, he said that time was running out. And he said, his grief to her was that he said that, my children are planning as if they have all of this time, and there is no more time. We are on borrowed time. He says there's no more time, and they're not living as if it is. He says they're living as if we have months and years, or should I say, I shouldn't say months, I'm not going to add any words, but years, all of this time, left, and we don't. And they're not ready. He says, my children are not giving my entire heart to them. They're still building their treasures here. And she's one, I nickname her Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, because she's always like crying for the nation. And we just talked about that, those who weep. She's always asking the Lord for more time. She's like, Lord, wait, because of some of the things that God has shown her in the recent years about what's coming to America that have confirmed the things that God has shown me. She said, Mina, my instinct as always is to say, Lord, just give us a little bit more time. She said, but this time he had just, he had sealed her lips. She was not allowed to ask for any more time for us on our behalf. And she said, Mina, she said, the word I want to use to you is devastation. She said, but I, that word is not even the proper word that that I can use to what is getting ready to transpire. She said the Lord looked at her in sternness, and he was silent, but he was speaking to her spirit. And he, she said, all I want to use is that devastation is coming to America, and the people are not ready. You know, the prophetess who spoke into your life 30 years ago, she just recently told you about 2016, that there were two phases, January to the end of February. This was a time of fasting. And then phase two, late February to September, would be preparation for great darkness. Yes. Now, she didn't say great darkness is coming during phase two. She said it's a time of preparation for the great darkness. Yes. And may I add, what I'm leaving out is that the second one, the, my friend in St. Louis, the Lord gave her a date which coincided with, with um, the prophetess who spoke to my, my, my mother's mentor set. Because she said through the end of, of September, like the very end, the girl in St. or the lady in St. Louis, the Lord gave her a date. The date was October 11th of 2016. She just wrote it down. And she was like, Mina, I don't even know what we, we were talking about. She said, I didn't know what the date was. We went to go. I said, girl, that's the time of the fall feast. Well, we found out that it's the day of Yom Kippur. 
the Day of Atonement. This is October of 2016 or 2017? 2016. 2016. This year. Mm-hmm. That was what she was getting. So I think it's all really interesting because of what is unfolding. You know, we're supposed to have these elections at the end of the year. Um, I've spoken, I've gone on a couple other programs um, since I was last on yours and, and, and spoken at many conferences, and I've talked about how I've paid attention. Since now, I've been paying, I've, I'm not that old, obviously, but I've paid attention to politics for roughly the last 17, 18 years, almost 20 years, because prior to that, um, uh, I wasn't, you know, I was too young. I mean, when I was born, I think Carter was the, I think that was the president, Reagan and Bush Sr. I was all a little girl, you know, at that time. And, and But Clinton is when I started paying attention to politics. Because there was a shift. There was just a shift in the world period in the 90s. I, I, and that's when I started paying attention, especially the late 90s. Um, and I was seeing, you know, I paid attention to uh, Clinton ran when, Bush, uh, George W. won, I mean, ran the first time. I knew he was going to win that first time. I knew he was going to win the second time. I talked about what I said in 2004 to that man on your first program. I knew Obama was going to win. The Lord told me that in April of 2008. I knew he was going to win again in 2012. Um but then I always talk about how when it comes to this election, how there's just this blank in the spirit realm. It's just this, I mean, it's like a flat line. And I talked about how I thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win and how the angel told me that the elections were going to be delayed. This is what I was told in April of last year. When I look at the elections and what's going on with the GOP candidates for both Republican and, um, and Democrats, it's just a mess. I, I'm, all I can get from this is a spirit of confusion. And I have never, I know politics is dirty and I know politics is corrupted, but I have never sent such a spirit of confusion and deception in the 20 years that I have paid, a mere 20 years that I've paid attention to politics. And that's all, I can't even look at it because it's just nothing but pure deception and confusion and I just keep saying they're trying to they're just entertaining us from a bigger picture if we listen I listen to pieces of the the state of the last quote-unquote state of the union address from Obama last month and I listened to 15 minutes of I can't really listen to him I just can't but I made myself listen because I wanted to hear what he was not saying and what he was saying with the spirit of discernment and all I can say is this, that speech that he gave was not the speech of a president who's leaving office. It's, and even the plans and the rules that he's making and these things that he's pushing for, even in this last year, it's like what he just, it's like he knows that he's going to continue either in his presidency or something greater, you know, whether it's, the Secretary of State, or excuse me, the, the yeah, the Secretary for the UN that he applies for, or whether it's him being here, or something big, or maybe, you know, I don't know. But the way he talks is not a vet who's going to retire like all the other presidents and be quiet. Or do you still believe that the election will be delayed? I still believe that, yes. It's just, I, one, I don't, I'm shocked that I shouldn't be shocked, but I'm surprised that they just had an article out that the millennials are voting for this Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is a socialist. He's a, he talks about his socialism. And I, I shouldn't be surprised because this current president has socialist ways. And he has a communist ways. I mean, he's, he's a dictator, a tyrant. But, um, so I shouldn't be surprised, but to know that this man who is an out, I mean, he's outwardly said he's a socialist. To know that the millennials are voting for Bernie Sanders over Hillary Clinton, that's, that's one thing that I'm, I'm surprised about. The, as far as the Republicans are concerned, it's just a mess. It's a mess. I mean, Donald Trump is trying to sue Ted Cruz and, and something about Ted Cruz spoke out against Israel and, 
I mean, it's just a mess. It's like watching a reality show. Yes, it is. It's like the American people have been conditioned to reality shows, and now the political campaign is a reality show, and they're going to vote for their favorite actor on the reality show. Yes. It's bizarre. This is one of the strangest, no, not one of, this is the strangest election I've ever seen in my lifetime. Only thing I can come to, Rick, is that it's all a distraction. Yes. I'll, I'll say, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I'll talk about it. I mentioned this to my ministry. I've talked about this several times now. Um, and just since January, um, in the last, I guess, four weeks now, it's been almost a month, um, people, several people now, three people that I know personally, I'm just going to say that, one person I don't know personally, but I heard about this happened to this, this particular person. But apparently the military has been contacting um, um, people who have been stocked up on large amounts of food and demanding that uh, they give inventory to uh, these I, I want to say it's the military. They said it's the military. I don't know if they're government officials or military or FEMA. And to me, they're all the same people. But three people that I know personally who have, who have large quantities of food and supplies or what have you that, that they have tucked away. I mean, they've been working on this for years. One person I know has been working on it for the last six years. They contacted them to get an inventory, and then they were told, that in case of a, a, a state of emergency, if they need their supplies, they will come and they will seize it. They will liquidate their, their food. And why they're doing that, I don't know. There was another lady who actually works for the government, and she bought a stockpiles of iodine and just because it was on sale. And they actually said uh, uh FBI agent to her house with a search warrant. I don't know what's going on. I don't, you know, I can't, I would never claim to know everything because I don't. And I always tell people we have to remember, even with prophets, even with dreams and visions that we see in part, we don't know everything. We God's the only one who has the whole picture. But when I say that these pieces are falling in line, that's why it just grieves me that people choose to be blind. They choose to be blind. But why are they taking, you know, count for food now? Bank of America just started this. Now, I heard that a whole bunch of other banks was doing this. I don't know. I've been with them since I was 17 years old, so I don't know. But I know that as of January 1st, if you have any cash deposits, they are not asking for your driver's license. They, you used to be able to put deposits in, and as long as you had the account number or your deposit slip, you just put it in. Now, if I go up there and I give them 100 checks and, I, and there's no cash, I can just give them my deposit slip and put it in there. We ought to turn this around on them when we take our cash to put it in their bank. Exactly. We should demand their driver's license. <laughs> I want to see your identity before I give you my money to hold. But this is what you were saying earlier. This is the move to the cashless society. Yes, and people better resist it with all their might right now because if they pull this off, we're going into slavery. Yeah. We're going into slavery. People better resist it. If you think this is all uh, just conspiracy theories and, and, you know, crazy talk, listen, it's right there in front of you in black and white. They're talking about eliminating cash. When they take your cash, you are a slave. You better resist it and you better be, be prepared to fight and die. They're going to put you in slavery and they're talking about doing it now, this year. Yes, they are. But it's all preparations for what's going, you know, what, again, this is, this goes back to why or not, you know, I tell people my assignment is to awaken the dead church. When I go into these places and they, I introduce myself, I says, my assignment is to awaken the dead church. We have to wake up. We have to wake up in America. 
but I, uh, I know that the majority of us are not going to wake up. We're not. We're, we're too bent on, you know, we're looking for some total disaster to happen in one day. And I always tell people, I says, you know, this goes back to me saying we see in part. Um, when we go into, I always like to give, again, the, the prophets of old, you know, the, not to say that this is the same extended time frame because we don't have this kind of time left, but Isaiah predicted the coming of the Messiah and how he would be born 750 years before he was born. We look at Daniel. Daniel was roughly a little bit over 400 years before Christ, and he predicted when the Messiah would be cut off. We're still waiting for the 70th week of Daniel, 2,450 years later. You know, we we have uh, Micah, we have Zechariah, we have Joel. It talks about the great and terrible day of the Lord, Jacob's trouble, the millennial reign of Christ before Christ had even come. Then we have the, the disciples who, well, Paul constantly and Peter talked about, we're living in the last days, the spirit of the Antichrist is already among us, and that was 2,000 years ago. Were they heretics? Were they false prophets? Were they, lunatic, you know, lunatics? No. But then today, you know, we're, we, we've, been, we've been conditioned for the now. We're the, we're the society and the generation of it has to happen now. It has to happen the way I want it to happen. And if it doesn't happen, if it isn't about me, then it doesn't exist. And that is the exact trick of Satan. And technology, the now, the Internet, all this stuff that has conditioned us to lose faith. Because now, because we have everything in our fingertips, we've conditioned not just our physical mind, our physical way of thinking, our carnal way of thinking, but we've also been conditioned spiritually. Mina, if they succeed in eliminating cash in 2016 or 17, and I've said for many, many years, one of the best tactics that they could use would be a plague that that contaminates paper money. The wow. paper money would have to be gathered up and burned in order to stop the plague. I could see how several of these things could play together, all right, that suddenly cash could be eliminated in, in a matter of months. Do you – I know you do, but I'm asking this rhetorically to the audience in general. Do you understand how – quickly we could be plunged into the mark of the beast system? Oh, well, all of this is definitely, this is, that's the whole purpose of all of it. I know, but you know what? We have to be careful here. We have to be careful here that we don't self-prophesy ourselves into slavery. That, that we, have, we have these Luciferian demoniacs who want this system, and it may not be God's time. It may not be, guys. We, you know, we have to be careful that we don't automatically assume that this is the end of, of, of the age because we may just be dealing with lunatics who want to rule the world. And the body of Christ better resist with all their might these lunatics that are seeking to gain control of the world uh, because if they succeed in in the near future to eliminate money, we're all going into slavery. And there will be no way out. That's it. For This could go on for centuries if Christ does not return. Centuries of slavery. And so it's, it's one of the da most dangerous, darkest times that's ever been on the planet. We have powerful men and women and institutions and entities that are plotting and scheming to eliminate money so that they can have control of the world. And that means control of 7 billion people. Yes. If they can get away with it, they're going to do it this year or within 2017. They have a timetable. They have a date of when they want a complete cashless society and they know when they want to transition that cashless society into a 
in Planet Microchip. They have that timetable. It's actually, their deadline is actually 2017. It's actually even in the script of, of Obamacare. The goal was to have it done by 2017. Now, whether that's January or December, I don't know. But that is actually the goal, and their deadline is next year. The last thing I wanted to share is um, the, the word that the Lord had given me um, for 2016 for or for America, um, and it's short, and I just wanted to read that. Sure, go okay. ahead. Okay, all right. It says, um, so I had to write it down. This was given to me three days ago, or well, four days ago now. The Lord spoke and he said, you being America, you have quoted my word over and over again. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. But you have not repented, O America. Your churches are that of the goat on the left that I spoke of. Is it not written that I will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. For I, have, I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will say to them, I surely I say this to you inasmuch you did not do it to the least of these. You did not do it unto me. America, because you have not humbled yourself or sought after me nor repented, and the churches within you have not cared for my lost and injured sheep. I will bring destruction from the left, war from the right, and I will cut off the head, says the Lord. That's what he gave me four nights ago. Well, that's certainly a sobering message. Well, the war is coming. Uh, it's, 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 it's imminent. Uh, I mean, I've, I've, I've lived for 17 years, since April 1998, I have lived 24-7 with the images and the sounds of war. Um, and it's like Jeremiah in chapter, chapter 4 of Jeremiah where he just cried out, my heart, my heart, it rises in pain. I've heard, oh, my soul, the sound of war. Uh, Jeremiah had to live with it for years. He knew what was coming, and I've had to live with this for 17 years. I, I see it, I smell it, I feel it, taste it. The Lord showed me utter destruction. It wasn't just um, a bad time for America. I saw utter destruction. I saw the cities laid waste. I saw refugees. I saw survivors, not people who, not Americans who had just experienced some inconvenience. They were survivors. And I believe it's at our doorstep. We have madmen running the world, running this nation, ungodly, evil. Christ-hating men and women in power. They're Christ-haters. Barack Obama is a Christ-hater. Hillary Clinton is a Christ-hater. The people in power in Washington are Christ-haters. I don't care what kind of lip service they give to Christianity. They're Christ-haters. And they are in power in this country, and they're lunatics, and they're bloodthirsty. They justify, they defend, they fight for the, the slaughter of unborn children. They fight for sexual perversion. 
They're full of devils. That's who's leading the country. Why would any person think that when your leaders are this sick and demented, that there's, this is going to have a happy ending? And so we're, we're standing at the very edge now of the cliff. And we're goading and taunting and daring Russia to fight with us. And Russia knows it. Russia knows that they're getting ready to attack them. And the attack is coming on the United States of America. It's going to be swift, sudden. America will never get up off the mat to be able to throw a punch back. That's what the Lord showed me. It will be sudden destruction. When Russia strikes, they will only throw one punch. There won't be a fight. There will be one punch, and it's over. It's lights out for America. And America will lay on the floor out cold. That's what's coming, Mina. Yes. And we have nobody to blame but ourselves. We've become vile and wicked, sadistic. I'm talking about as a society. I mean, our culture is absolutely sickening. It's a sickening culture. And, and, and it's permeated with death and wickedness. And we're, we're, going to, we're going to reap that which we're glorifying. And truthfully, I mean, I used to believe that, that uh, I used to just, you know, I tell myself that, well, the Christians will be protected uh, when this happens. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, yeah, you'll be protected. Your soul will be protected. But you're not your physical body. You can be instantly in the presence of the Lord. But your physical body is not going to be protected in this. And that's why I'm telling people, make sure you're right with God. Make sure you do a heart check every day, every single day. Check your soul. Check your heart. Make sure there's nothing hidden in your, in your soul, in your, in your mind, in your heart. Just let the Holy Spirit shine his light inside all of the dark cavities of your soul and remove all traces of wickedness and sin and rebellion. Because it's going to be instant vaporation for hundreds of millions of people. And uh, we have nobody to blame but ourselves. If time continues for 50, 100 years, and Christ does not return in a time frame, historians will write about the age when America went mad, absolutely went insane, because that's what's taking place right now. A country has gone insane. You know, God said that to Israel. Is there any, any place in time? He said this to ancient Israel. When a nation has rejected the God who blessed them, that's what America has done. And in the future, historians are going to look at us and say they had everything, and they threw it away. They went insane. They just absolutely lost their minds. And uh, they have nobody to blame but themselves. We'll, be, we'll just be a footnote in history. The, the empire that was – that ruled the world for a brief time and then – was vaporized, and life goes on. If God chooses, if it's God's uh, sovereign will that, that the age continues. But that's where we're at. And if you think this isn't going to happen, folks, then you are really deceived. You're not paying attention to what's going on in the Middle East right now. You're not, you're not reading the speeches that Vladimir Putin is giving. You're not – 
you're not monitoring the threats, the warnings that are being issued by high-level Russian uh, defense and foreign affairs officials clearly telling the United States they're prepared to go to war with us. And it's like the country's in, in a, a stupor, like some kind of crazy gas has come over the country. It's a delusion. It's a delusion that has come over this country. Mina, thank you so much. I appreciate you spending this time with me today. My, my guest, Mina Lee Gribben. Uh, she's in Charlotte, North Carolina. Her ministry is Faithful Walk Healing Ministries. The website, Faithful Walk Healing Ministries.com. God bless you, Mina. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I enjoyed this program. God bless you. 